everybody here. I know we still have some pizzas holding out back there, so if anybody has, is not full, we'll dig back in. We don't need to take any or leave any here tonight. So uh, just want to thank you guys for coming out here. The traffic's real smooth out there. Nothing going on. Uh, so I know everybody just, just had at it. So I think uh, thank you so much. I see I see that the real ladies here, huh? Yeah. How about that? So I, I obviously you guys are here to see these guys, and, and but we always love being a part of this and being a part of, of your your fishing and, and your boating needs here. Obviously, uh, I did want to make mention that we do have the Destin Commons, the boat show this weekend. So I don't know if you guys were aware of it, but it's, it's, we move in on Friday and Saturday, Sunday. So we do have some of the, the sales professionals here. If you guys are in, in need of anything, we're there. If you need to retire, we'll have some service there. But if you need a new boat, we've got a couple real pretty ones around here. So whatever we can do to to help, please let us know. But again, we just like to be a part of your fishing, and, and I hear the, the fishing is going on pretty good right now. I it's, think this weekend's going to be nice. Yeah, this weekend's going to be nice for a change. Which is cool. Um, so. Saturday, Sunday look real good, and Friday is pretty good. So, definitely. So I think Saturday at the Commons, uh, if you're not fishing, you can come see us between 10 and 10 and 6. I think it's 11 and 5 on Sunday. So we'll about be out there having a good time. I think the weather's going to be wonderful. So. Please come join us. But again, just want to thank you guys for being a part of it and get something to drink and eat and just look forward to seeing you guys soon. So, Thanks, Todd. Hello. My name is Captain Mike Parker. I'm the fishing instructor at Destin High School. And we're going to have our annual fundraiser. This one, too. So it's also on. That one goes on the web. Yep, one. You're on the internet, Mike. All right. We're going to have our annual fundraiser this Saturday at Half Inch Tackle. Tim helped us with that last year. He's going to be helping us again this year. And what we do is raise funds to, number one, build artificial reefs. And last year, Alex Fogg helped us put out, there's a total actually of 11 big reefs, pyramid reefs. And uh, we're going to do the same this year. For those who want to uh, contribute uh a reef with a name on it like a memorial we have already five spoken for this year if you pay a thousand dollars alex fogg in the county contributes a thousand dollars to match it for because each reef costs two thousand dollars and so if you've got a loved one or you know a friend somebody that wants to put a name on a reef as a memorial we we do that and like i said we raised uh, enough for 11 of them last year but we're going to have a garage sale too that's going to have all kinds of a lot of it's used fishing tackle. Y'all may have some stuff you want to donate, uh, extra rods that you don't use, or any tackle, tackle boxes, coolers. Uh, we also have a lot of boat cleaning products, brand new cleaning products, Starbright and stuff that we're going to have at a real good price that, uh, that you can purchase. But uh, John at Sea Market is going to come out with his smoker, and he's going to smoke a, a lot of chicken quarters and Boston butts, and so we'll have stuff to eat. It's going to start at 7 in the morning and go till 2 in the afternoon. And uh, if any of y'all want to volunteer to help, do we have anybody here maybe that want to come out and help us? We uh, we need a few volunteers to help, you know, a lot of stuff going on. If I'm not fishing, I'll be there, Mike. Okay. Yeah, you were there last year. I appreciate your help. And all, all you did. But uh, any of y'all that uh, have some free time Saturday, just come out and, and help us out. But uh, anything you got, like I say, to donate or come out and just look and, and purchase something. Or if you just want to write a check to help us, because it also supports the field trips that we take over to Orange Beach to watch a bell of reef. And we put the names on the reefs. We go to Gulf West uh, Maritime Museum. Have any of y'all ever been there over in Mobile? Y'all need to look into that. It is a fascinating.
uh, the field trips that we take. But, uh, thank you for your time and hope to see some of y'all this Saturday. Well, well, now time's up. So. You guys enjoyed the. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. No, I'll definitely be there. As long as I'm not fishing, I'll be there too, Mike. Okay, thank you. That's a pretty cool program. Pretty cool. Yeah, it Thanks. is. I mean, um, for for y'all that don't really realize what's going on there, uh, the Dustin High School formed this fishing class, and the first year they had just one class, and um, I'm pretty sure, if I'm correct now, they have two advanced and one beginner class. Is that right, Mike? So they're doing three classes. This is the first accredited fishing class in the state. And a lot of other counties and municipalities are looking at doing this with their local high schools and junior high schools. You know, a lot of them have fishing clubs and stuff, but none of them have actually accredited classes. So it's a really cool thing for our local kids. And it's, you know, some of these, some of the kids that are in this class, you know, they may end up being charter boat captains or deckhands, or they might be end up working at our store one day or somewhere like Bass Pro or somewhere like that. It's just, it's a way to get them, you know, trained into doing something that they they can enjoy for a lifetime of doing. So I think it's a great deal. Yeah. I, See, there you go. I, I would have loved to have been in that program. Oh, it saved, saved me a lot of time. <laughs> sign me up. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm Tim Broom with Half Inch Tackle here in Destin. And this is Captain Mark Coatsy, my fishing partner with uh, 30A Light Tackle. And tonight we're talking about one of the passion things that we love to do. Um, you know, we've had some really good success during the fishing rodeo doing this whole slow pitch jigging thing. Um, Mark won Captain of the Year in 2022? I think in the, no, 2020. I think in the last three years, we've won 36 divisions or yep. four years or something like that in the rodeo. So yep. most of them have been caught on jigs. Um, and it's... I'm going to have some weird opinions tonight. Like there's systems and there's things that are designed to work a certain way and there's a lot to do, but I, and I don't want to talk about myself for too long. I didn't grow up in Destin. I didn't learn how to fish here. And I think that's good and bad. I think some guys like Tim who've been fishing here for their whole lives have a really good understanding of the fishery. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I think I had a little weird, I don't, I wouldn't say advantage, but I just didn't get stuck doing the same thing that everybody did. Uh, and I think it's been a fun, I mean, it, for me, not to get deep, but it's been a fun evolution of learning the water from you in a weird way that I've done in the past and stuff. So it's, while there are, like I said, systems and things designed to work a certain way, I'm going to be totally honest with you and tell you how I feel catch fish here um, using my tackle. And if you go out there on the internet and read about this stuff, and there's a tremendous amount of good information out there, but there's a lot of false things out there too, because they tell you you have to have this reel, or you have to have this rod, and you gotta fish with this super light line and different things. And we're gonna talk about all those, but there is no wrong way to do this unless you just have tackle that's just overly too heavy. I think you know? you're right. And it, I think a way of wording it is like, it can get as, and my background's in engineering. I, my degree's in mechanical engineering. Like I'm a nerd. Like I <laughs> think way too hard about fishing when I'm not on the water, or especially if like I can't get a good bite that I'm looking for, like I'll go home and YouTube it and read about it. And like, don't do that. Like that really hurts sometimes. Um, but it can get as technical or as scientific as you want it to be. But the more you think about it, it's like like we were talking about golf a second ago. The harder you analyze your golf game, sometimes you just need to go out there and play golf. And then you'll, you'll be a surprisingly better golfer. We, and we're going to talk about these techniques. But there's a lot of days when I find I can take my jig, drop it to the bottom, and do nothing but just do this and pretend it's a sabiki rig. And you're going to go do more. And there he is. Scam. So, especially that's, scam. It's a scam bite. You know, and it's just bouncing it just like it's a, you know. And, and our, and uh, like, uh, I've, like I said, I watch a lot of how to's and I watch a lot of videos and I think about this really hard. Um, a lot of jigging, and if, if you look at the history of it, and I don't think we need to get into all that stuff unless people really want to, because that's, I mean, this has been around now for a while. 
but s slow pitch in particular and a lot of jigging is typically in deeper water and we're lucky here where we don't have tw i mean you if you can certainly go out to 1200 feet of water if you want to but we have every not every species but a lot of species of fish anywhere from 60 feet to i mean if you get over the edge in the three four hundred feet you i i use this every day on my boat in state water and i think traditional slow pitch jigging how it was designed and that stuff is typically in deeper water uh and deep diff, different stuff but i think tonight and i'm going way off topic of your stuff here yeah. but how i fish in state water using lighter tackle is is significantly different than a lot of the stuff that you you kind of expect or that you'd hear about yeah but you know the the whole slow pitch jigging thing if you if you haven't tried it you need to go out and at least experiment with this because it's a super fun way of fishing and the best way to learn it is commit to do it one day don't leave the don't leave the pass and take frozen bait and catch and catch live bait. <laughs> Just go jigging and let it let it mature. You know, I did the whole thing about when I tried to learn how to fly fish. Um, random story, but when I tried first trying to catch a plagic on a fly rod, well, I wasn't very good at. It. I couldn't catch a. I I've seen a picture. I've seen bonitas. a picture of this. <laughs> but um, the first day we did it, we, we weren't catching anything, so we we're out there around the sea buoy. Well, I got aggravated with the fly fishing, so I took and put on a stinger rig and a live cigar minnow and flipped it out there on the fly rod, and sure enough, I caught a king mackerel. Um, and I learned a valuable lesson that day, too. Um, it was kind of, this was 20 or 30 years ago before we had anti-reverse fly reels, and you had to palm the reel for drag. Well, when I went to palm that reel, well, being an inexperienced fly angler, that little knob hit me in the palm of my hand oh, man. about a thousand times before I could <laughs> yank my hand off of there. Um, but just go slow pitch and don't take all your other stuff with you and you'll learn it much faster. And sometimes like this time of year where, I mean, now I guess there's bait starting to show up the past couple of days, but when we go, go out on charter and we can't find bait or can't find the baits that we want, it's a pretty cool feeling to go, oh, we've got jigs. Yeah. Especially this time of year when things aren't nearly as heavily pressured in close. And it, you know, this, this is, proof, is ridiculous. This is actually proof that anybody can do this, you know. You don't have to, you know. This is on Mark's boat, even. Yeah, I was. I took that picture. I was a little disappointed. <laughs> it, you popped up pretty quick once you hooked up, though. Hopefully, I don't. Hopefully, we don't have volume on these. Yeah. That's just fair warning, just in case. But here's here, here's of course the snapper, and then here's our favorite friend right here. Yes. We, we had been there for a while. We had some chum in the water. We had caught a, a bunch of fish, too. But so I just want this picture here is just for to tell you about how some of this gear works. Uh, we were out la a week ago Thursday, and we were actually mingo fishing on this particular day and fishing with squid. Um, I had squid and cut cigar on the on the rod. And I don't know if this Warsaw actually ate the bottom, half a cigar minute we had on there, or if he, a Mingo ate it and then a, and then the uh, Warsaw grabbed it. But anyway, if you, after the thing, I, we invite y'all to come up here and look at some of the tackle that we have. But when you look at some of this gear and you think, well, there's no way you're catching these fish. This Warsaw was every bit of 40 and close to 50 pounds. We caught him in 360 feet of water on a two hook rig mingo fishing. But on these, it's actually the little spinning rig that's over there. It's on a uh, Shimano Saragossa 6,000 reel with 50 pound braid. Now, did it take a while? Yeah, it was, it was 45 minute fight, but it works. I, I think one takeaway from that is, yeah, you can use tackle, but I think the fighting fi big fish on lighter gear, you learn a lot more about how to fight fish. And, I, and I, I don't know what's coming up in your, or in the presentation about steering fish around and controlling the fish and, and getting them in quicker and all that. And we'll probably get into that stuff. Yep. Um, but the more in tune you are of what's actually happening with your tackle, and that, I think that's why we fish generally with much nicer tackle, because it, you can feel it. And I think it, it says a lot about how you're going to steer that fish around and catch that fish. Yeah. 
It's very similar, like if you uh, go back to the fly fishing thing, you know, they catch 200 pound tarpons on fly rods and it's about learning how to lead the fish. Your tarpon goes this way. If you put pressure towards his tail, he will turn and come back the other way. If you try to just get in a, a, a tug of war with a tarpon on a fly rod, he's gonna win every time. But if you learn how to guide him with the rod, then you can easily fight a 200 pound tarpon on a fly rod. It's the same thing on the jig. And, and I guess, I mean, we'll, we'll cover this yeah. now. I tell every single day I get, I mean, there are people on my, I run a full-time charter and people get on my boat and they're like, what am I supposed to do with this? And every species of fish, I mean, I can't control what bites, but typically it's kind of like, okay, all right, we're going to fish either bottom, we're going to fish for pelagics like kings and tunas and mahi, or we're going to do something. Typically, here's how those fights go. And I try and I go through this whole thing and I should just sit down and make a YouTube video or something, but no one's ever going to watch it before they get on my boat anyway. But I go through this whole long talk about, okay, I think fish are relatively dumb until you're trying to catch them and they're really hard. But I think fish are dumb and they don't really know what's happening. They just know that they ate something and it's not right. So, if, I mean, luckily our water here is so clear and I think we'll come back to that because that really will help your jigging. Um, but the, the fish doesn't know what's happening. So he'll bite something, he knows something's wrong and he'll kind of throw up everywhere and chum the water up for everything else. But if you don't make that fish mad, you, you can steer him around. So fish breathe by getting water over their gills and extracting the oxygen. If you can keep him from running, like, or with the example I like to use the most is a bonita. I mean, a bonita on an on a inshore fishing rod is A, fun, but B, it's perfect for people to learn how to steer it. And you'll see people on one side of the boat and all of a sudden their fish is jumping out of the water over there and they're like, oh, I wanna walk over here. I'm like, stick that damn rod in the water and steer him back over. And you'll see people start steering a fish and A, it'll get the fish to the boat quicker. The fish is in a strain, so if you're gonna let him go, he'll swim right away. Or if you're gonna harvest it, the meat's a lot better because he's just not, the longer the fight lasts, the worse your chances are of getting that fish in. So the more, you understand about fighting a fish and think about it. Cause I mean, I know you guys all hook a ton of bonitas. So the next time just learn to steer them around and you'll be surprised how fast you can gain on them while steering them around. And that, I mean, I think slow pitch is obviously a much more vertical thing. And some of the examples that I think of when slow pitch jigging is a lot like topwater fishing and making that your topwater dart across the water. Um, it's the same, it's a very similar style of while they may not be taking off that way full speed, they're trying to go down and their fight's not long. It's just a couple, like just hold on for that dig because they don't have a whole lot of wind, especially if you're keeping them from breathing. Um, so it's just the, the more cognizant you are of maybe what that fish is doing, I think it helps the fight a lot. Yeah. And I'm going way off topic. We haven't even started talking about anything <laughs> really. You know, and the whole jigging thing, this will work for all, realistically for every species that we do here this is just one where we had this is a trip earlier this spring had two banded rudder fish at a time you know deep water jigging you know here's uh, a couple uh, yellow or no snowies you know of course red snapper and the, um, another pair of double amber jacks and the one that a lot of people say this you know, just definitely work for that's about a four or five pound trigger fish and that one, I think, is on Captain Mark Luciani's boat. I saw him here earlier. Mark Luciani just asked me about mingo fishing on, trig, uh, on, a, on jigs. Biggest mingo I've ever seen in my life. Like, significantly largest mingo I've ever seen we caught on a jig. You know, amberjack snapper combo. Um, so it will really work for almost anything, any species you're going to fish for. And these are all pelagic pictures, but if you know, if you're on a place where there's kings or bonitas or tunas, I mean, slow pitch jigging at the fads for tunas, black fins, yellow fins, either one. This this works for all Ima the different species. Imagine hooking into a wahoo on this. It's awesome. Well, it's not much bigger, not much smaller. Or the combo we caught the winning wahoo on last year wasn't much bigger. So, and I'll it was get on it. a 6,000 size reel. And like I said earlier, I've got weird opinions on all this stuff. And I'll get into how I do it, and which is not at all how it's supposed to be done. Uh, but it works. And our, like Tim said, I prefer fishing spinning gear. 
Um, and we did win the rodeo with a fish Oahu caught on a spinning rod on a circle hook with fluoro. You know, that's out of. So one of the things you need, you do need to do, you know, someone came up and asked earlier before we got started, they asked the question, well, where do I go slow pitch jigging at? You go slow pitch jigging at the same places you, you fish for everything else. If you're using bait for snapper and grouper there, you can use slow pitch there. Um, there, there it's not as, we got to go to a special slow pitch spot, but you do need to be able to learn how to find bottom and read bottom. I will say too, and I, I again, I, feel like I'm cutting you off but this is literally like my like we do a lot of these seminars and this is one that I'm like very connected to I think um, I do think there's an order of operations that when you get on a spot I, yes. ha I have is that coming up well, yeah we'll cut yeah. okay um, but you do you know you do have to be able to find the bottom and if you know on your bottom machine, I'm sure most, most Garmin seems to be the most prevalent, but if you have a Garmin unit and you haven't invested in the relief shading part for your Garmin, you need to do that. Um, if you have uh, Simrad or one of the other brands, um, you need to get the uh, Seymour charts, which is the same thing in the, in the, in the shading. And this, that one photo is out of place there, but we'll come back to that. Um, but if you're just looking out on some on your regular fishing chart, this is right off of my phone in Active Captain. When I have relief shading turned off, you can look and you can see I have some places marked here, and here's the here's a contour line. But the places aren't exactly on the contour line. Well, without relief shading, you could never go find this area. I mean, it's just, there's not enough information on it, just a fishing chart. But when you add relief shading, there's the same two places. That's that 240 line that we saw on the other one. This is a half a mile off the line, but yet these are right on a ridge. And so technically, even if you didn't have these numbers, you could come down to this ridge and just start working your way down the ridge. You would eventually find the fish on that ridge. And they won't always be on the exact numbers because um, they're going to move up and down that ridge. But that's, a, you know, uh, Garmin, it used to be uh, G3, G3 Vision. Blue Charts, G3 Vision yeah. Plus. And then and, it became Vision Plus. Well, then it became Navionics Vision Plus. Yeah. And it's a, it's a $249 for your inv initial investment. And then they do yearly updates. Um, and if you want the updates, they're $125 a year. If you don't, you can just go with your um, one-time subscription. It won't actually, once you download it, it's on there for, for good. Um, and then also, if you don't have, I'm going to let Mark tell you about this, but have you ever gone, if you, if your boat has autopilot, you probably already have it, but if you don't have a heading sensor of some sort, and if you've noticed when you start to go to your spot and you're kind of starting to, when you're running at a speed, the line to go to your spot works very well, but when you start to slow down and now you're, the spot's here and you're over here, and it's showing this little line where you should go. And as you start to turn, there's this lag before your boat ever catches up on screen to where that where you need to be. I, I see some people nodding their heads. There there is a heading lag sometimes. And basically there's a GPS receiver in the chart plotter. And if the boat's not moving, it doesn't know which direction it's facing. So sometimes at super low speeds, like Tim said, there is a lag when you're looking for your spot four boats that don't have autopilot and more aggressive heading sensors and GPS receivers. This is what I added on my boat. It almost, I mean, it took one calibration and it basically eliminated heading lag on my boat. So it, it was actually took a learning curve to get used to running my boat without the heading lag at slow speeds once I got close, because I'm kind of like, all right guys, hang on, I'll find it. Um, but it is a GP, it's a much better GPS position receiver but also has a built-in heading sensor, so you know which direction your boat is pointing. And I think the big picture in this is the more you understand 
not only your tackle, like we were just talking about, but your electronics, you will catch more fish if you know what you're doing and what you, if, you're, if you know what you're looking at on the screen. In this part of the seminar, this'll, this leads into the slow pitch jigging, but this goes along with everything else that you would do, whether you're just going out there traditional bottom fishing or going trolling or whatever. These are things that you need to know to be able to do any of that. And, and I'm even going to go farther as to say, I mean, you have fish point and helm master makes a big difference. I think there is an advantage sometimes to drifting over a spot and covering a little bit of ground when you're fishing. But me personally, I'm, if you can't tell, like I'm all over the place, by the way, I'm talking about this. What are you laughing at? I'm, I'm all over the place talking about it. So you can imagine how excited I am on my boat. I can't stay on the sticks the whole time running my boat while this is going on. So for me, having either some kind of electronic uh, position holding or a trolling motor on the boat, and I much prefer fishing with a trolling motor, especially how the styles that we, that I fish with, um, but a trolling motor, electronics, and good tackle, I think makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Yes. And then, you know, learning we all have the stuff and we need to learn how to use it and for i'm gonna cover up this side for a second this side over here is the whole bottom and this is showing from zero to 210 feet well most people would probably pull up onto this spot and go there's nothing here let's go but we have good quality bottom we have my, Mark's favorite word, these little fuzzy thingies. This is how he talks on the boat, too. He's like, ooh, look at the fuzzies. And, like, of course, just the amount of time we spend together. Now, I call them fuzzies, and every time I hear Tim say fuzzies, it becomes a thing. But the little fuzzies that it's showing down here, though, that's not only we have hard bottom, but we have living corals on the bottom. So this is what we call live bottom or natural bottom. But we do have some fish. Well, on this side, we've split the screen in half and are only looking at the bottom 30 feet. Well, now what we're seeing here looks much better. And on when, we, when you're on a wreck, you got the wreck sticking up and then there's all these fish up above the wreck. Well, when we're fishing natural bottom, there's little coral heads and ledges and rocks and all the fish, most of them are underneath that. There's a few showing. And, but as you start to drop to the bottom, the bottom will just come alive. And I see so many people drive right past fish that they should be catching. I don't know how many sonar slides that you have coming up, but I have so, Not much, very, I have so much to say. Very few. <laughs> okay, sorry, Legendary. Um, but I am a nerd with this stuff, like I said, and I think if you know what you're looking at, you will catch a lot more fish. Sure, everybody's seen big shows of snappers or triggers or baits and any of that, and we've gone through whole seminars about what to look for. I do, shameless plug, I'll admit it, I do electronics training on the side about how to set up your chart water, because even this, I can tell by looking at it, there's like six or seven, I'm serious, like six at least, settings that I would change to be able to know what you're looking for because often we'll get on some of his fuzzies and we'll look at it and we'll we'll start doing something and I'll look at it and I'll go you see that and then immediately we'll like cut something off and tie something different on and it, or like that yeah I do have one. that actually looks a lot better um yeah you can go ahead is that my boat no, no. that's not because it's got that um that's a similar set up to kind of how I would use mine with a scope and peak hold turned on and a different color gain um, and some different settings but I think like I just said the more you know what you're looking at especially if you can kind of identify typically what some of those returns look like you can adjust not only what you're fishing with but how you're fishing for catching different species so for those that don't know you just said you would always have a scope turned on why so sonar is basic, I mean, it, it's pinging off the bottom and sonar comes out in a cone. That cone, if you look at the bottom of this, so this column here is actually what the actual sonar return at that instant. And most of your sonar display is history. That sonar cone that comes out, you can see this one is 150 feet. 
that's the diameter of the cone at the bottom. So you're in 250 feet of water. Obviously, if you're shallower, that cone will be more narrow. And if you're deeper, it'll get bigger. Um, and with peak hold turn on, this is actually the return of what's there. So it looks like, yeah, there's something going on up here. There's a lot here, but you can actually see what's going on. And realistically, I first used it to really show people on my boat because I have so many tourists who are like, what are you? I'm like, oh my God, look at the black snappers. And they're like, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, okay, well, this column is live and this is all history. So you can see here, like now they're all on the bottom and you throw some chunks of bait over and you'll see them kind of moving up a little bit and doing different things. Um, I'm like, this is all, this is all history. Um, so I, I, one of the first things I do on, on a new boat is I'll turn off Surface, uh, surface noise, noise. I'll turn on a scope, I'll turn on peak hold. And luckily for us here in Destin, most of the, the technology and the transducers is similar, but the water quality that we're all fishing the same water. So a lot of times that the settings can be adjusted to cover them. But we have we've had whole seminars on this stuff. But um, I, what I call a, I call a scope the poor man's live scope. So instead of having that actual like 3D picture of fish moving around underneath the boat. Once you get used to looking at this, I, I say it's like the matrix where you start seeing things and you're like, oh, you should probably try this. And then you hear drag start screaming off. Um, so, <laughs> so now we're actually going to talk about this <laughs> jigging. <laughs> so to some degree, the slow pitch is a system. And the, well, probably one of the few mistakes you can make is just is what I would call having a broomstick. If your rod is so stiff that you have no feel, it's two things. You're not going to, you don't have feel, so you don't have control over your jig. And you're not going to be able to properly impart the correct action on your jig. So it is a combination of rod, reel, line, leader, top shot, jigs, and hooks. And we're going to cover each, all these different things in here. Um, but if there's any one thing on here that is most important, it's the very first one, and it's that you must be fishing vertically. Um, and by vertically, I mean when you you got to be jigging your jig and it's going straight up and down. If you have a bunch of scope in your line and the jig's way over there, you're not imparting the proper action to the jig, and you have no idea what the jig is doing, and you've lost control of the depth of water, and you have to be in the strike zone, and we're going to have pictures of that too, where you need to be jigging. So that, that goes back to having, you do need light enough line that you don't have a bunch of scope to it, um, and you need the proper size jig. The lighter the jig, the easier it is to impart action. And the lighter the jig, the more action you get. But sometimes we have, as we go deeper or the current increases, we have to go to bigger jigs to be able to fish vertical. Um, you know, and one thing that Mark said earlier, and this is on here, drifting over natural bottom, this is a good way of finding new spots for snapper group or whatever it is at a later time and today by drifting um, because you can drift and keep covering a lot of area but if you are going to drift it's still the same thing you may have to go to a heavier jig to be able to fish vertically if the boat's actually in motion um, you know most of the strikes are going to happen once you once you impart action on the jig in some fashion on the fall is when you're going to get your bite um, And like the last one, it says the slower the jig falls, the more bites you get. And that slower jig fall comes from having the lightest possible jig that we can have to be able to still fish vertical. Or the right shape jig. Or the right shape jig. I think, and again, I'm, I'm all over the place tonight. Um, I think the most important thing, you know, like if there's, if I was sitting where you guys are and I sat there for, a long time and I would never be the fisherman I am if it wasn't for a lot of the stuff that Tim tells everybody over the years so thank you for doing that first of all um, I think the number one takeaway obviously other than asking me how your electronics work 
Um, when you, our water's so clear, and if you can, I mean, it's not right now. It's pretty gross right now, especially in state water. I don't know if you guys have, have seen how brown the water is. But learning how or what your jig is doing, and, and again, I, I think I think a lot more about this than I need to. You want your blue slides? My blue? Um, not yet. Okay. Um, well, I mean, that'll come up. But if you know what your jig is doing in the water, I think it'll help. And I used that analogy earlier of that top water bite. Like, you can see walking the dog going across the top, and you're like, hey, that looks pretty good how this is going. So if I was a fish looking up and I saw the jig or my top water plug kind of darting like this, luckily our water's so clear. So especially like a new shape jig or a jig that I've never seen before, I want to see what it does. And I'm sure we'll talk about pitches and cranks and lifts and all this stuff, but I'll drop my jig in the water over the side of the boat and look down until I really can't see it anymore. And I'll give it some turns, I'll give it some rod action and just see what gets that thing to dart the way it's supposed to. And, or, and I think there's whole opinions and I think slow pitch jigging is called the thing. I'm not sure if that's what the Japanese intended it to be called. Um, but pitch can be defined a number of different ways. But basically what I'm saying is if you look at your jig over the gun on your boat and you're lifting the rod up, if you're cranking real hard just to see what it's doing and getting it to jump a certain way and flutter down and jump the other way and flutter down and walk the dog up the water column a certain way, if you know what your jig is doing 10 feet under the boat, then once it's down a lot farther, it's probably going to do something a lot similar. And you'll probably get a little bit of a feel in the rod and reel, especially holding it the right way and getting that the certain blanks that we use and, and feeling all that stuff to know what your jig's actually doing in the water, if that makes any sense. And, that, and he's exactly right on that. You know, we've often talked, we keep talking about it, we never do it, is going and getting out in my backyard with my pool when, where the water is really clear and then and then taking a bunch of the different jigs and get the GoPro and go underneath the water and actually film what they're doing. And yeah, because like this we, one's going to flutter completely different than one of these. These are going to jerk a certain way real fast. And, and but again, I think we'll get into all that. Yeah. I'm just really into this, you guys. I'm sorry. You know, and basically what Mark just said is, you know, there's the short little stubby jigs. These are going to have the most action to them. They're going to react more in the water because they're wide and they have different cut angles on them. This happens to be um, one of those little Shimano flat fall jigs. And, you know, we have the uh, Shimano flat side jigs. Excuse me? <laughs> but, and then, you know, then we have like a pencil shaped jig. So a pencil jig like this one, this would be more for a very heavy current day or a very deep water situation. And the reason for that, this one has, this one will cut the water much better and allow you to get deeper and the current won't affect it as bad. But a pencil style jig is not going to have nearly the action that something that's wider and flatter is going to have. So we need different jigs for different conditions. Um, the calmer it is, the less current there is, the shallower the water is, we want a jig that fall, a, a, a wider uh, jig will fall much slower and that will give the fish more time to actually bite. And, and if you guys, and I say this every time I start talking about fish, when, if you are gonna keep something and you harvest that fish, look and see what he's been eating. For me, my, not necessarily the shape is, well, definitely the shape, but the size of my jigs has changed a ton based on the stomach contents that I find in a lot of these fish that we do keep, especially in shallower water. So in choosing, in choosing a jig, you know, the most important thing is style. Whether we're, whether we're fishing with something that's short and stubby that, that grabs a lot of water or something that's more of a pencil shape. The next thing is size, because size is gonna, the, the, the lighter the jig, the easier it is for us to impart action on it and the slower it will fall. 
and then the last thing is color, um, which that is kind of opposite of, mo like if we're picking out mirror lures for trout fishing or soft plastics for redfish, we're picking, most of the time we're picking color first, then size. Um, I, I think a lot of it's preference and what you have good luck on. So like for me, I prefer fishing well, you only fish with one jig. That is not true, but 95% of the time, I prefer a certain jig because that works. And you prefer a certain jig, and we both have different ones on, and you catch a bunch of trash fish, and I always catch the good one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, okay. No, you know, you know, uh, you know I'm kidding. But it's, I think a lot of lures in the industry are made to attract the fishermen sometimes more so than the fish. So like I, I like certain jigs and honestly, the jigs that I prefer um, have changed based on what have gotten bites. Um, but I do. <laughs> so, I well, just... we can make this real simple, you know. The Shimano, this is the Shimano uh, butterfly flat side jig. This one here is white and silver stripes. This is a killer jig. This is Mark's favorite jig. This, this is the one that, that's his first one to reach out of the box. And it would be my second. And my first is the JY jig. It's a pink with um, the same silver and white stripes in it. Either one works equally well. I, I think it'll work a lot better too, though, if you know what you're doing. So I'm gonna say it again, like whenever you get a jig, and I'm sure you guys have a bunch of jigs at, on your boat. And when you're like, try straight retrieving it, try throwing it around a certain way, try a big crank on it, depending on your rod. Um, just see what it does in the water and see if you can get it to act erratically. Because a lot of like high speed jigging, like you, most guys when I moved here did for Amberjack, real fast stuff, it's a reaction base, it's a chase. And we talk a lot about mimicking the old, the weak, the wounded especially when you talk about trolling mm -hmm. or king mackerel fishing or any of that stuff and you're doing the same thing but instead of the chase you're trying to mimic i think a like a hurt fish and and if you can think like that fish like all right what the hell is that thing and you're looking at it and and i guess it's, it's kind of like playing with my dogs like if i hold a toy out in front of my dog and my dog's looking at it and she's like I don't want that. But if I like get it close enough where she's like, okay, maybe I want to eat this. And then I pull it away. She's like, all right. But if I keep doing that over and over, she gets used to it. And then if I kind of get closer and then I like maybe let her get it and pull on it and then let go and grab it back, she gets really into it. And I think it's similar with some of those fish. Like if you're doing the exact same thing and they're just looking at it like, I don't know what that is. But if you let, like, if you change it up, if you keep it guessing, but if you know what your jig is sort of doing down there, I think you'll get more bites. Yeah. And like for me, you know, and I'm all over the place tonight. You don't have, and there's not like one jig that you have to buy. But you know, like for me, I grew up as a kid fishing with Rapala lures for trout and redfish. And I can get on the boat with somebody else that grew up fishing mirror lures. I can sit there and blaze the trout and the redfish on a um, Rapala, because that's how I grew up, and I know just the little twitch to do it. I can't hardly catch one on a mirror lure. And the, my guy fishing right next to me throwing a mirror lure and just smashing them. But it's just, it's what you're accustomed to, and it's what you're accustomed to and what you have confidence in. Confidence if, is a big part. you part. believe that you're gonna get a bite, you're gonna get a bite. Plus, I think I get a lot more bites on the jigs that I like, because I use them a lot more. You know, this next one, this is, don't take this as a hard, firm rule because wind, current, conditions, everything is going to affect this. But when you're choosing a jig, the basics is one gram for one foot of water depth and then one gram for every two or three uh, foot of water on a real light current. It's just a real basic guide as to the weight of your jig. And we sell jigs from anywhere from I think the, about the lightest ones that we have are about 40 grams, and we carry them up to almost 400 grams. Um, so we do carry a lot of variety in jigs, and you need to have variety of jigs. That one we are, you know, those, both of us, you know, my favorite, the JYs, Mark's favorite, the uh, Shimano flat side jigs.
And that, that go back one, that shows you kind of a, a fall pattern on these. Because Tim said earlier, a lot of that strike is on the flutter, on the fall. Um, well, I say that, but that's... Well, you'll, you'll catch one on the upward stroke. I think we just catch more on the fall. Yeah. Um, but that kind of shows you the flutter pattern. And that's something, too. Like, if you're standing on the boat looking in the water, you can see that over the gunnel and see what the jig's doing. And like I say, if you have a pool in your backyard, the best, you go in the backyard, you can practice any time. Um, Just be careful when that jig gets close to the surface because that thing will come flying out of the water if you're not paying attention. You know, and this is one where we need to know what our, our depth, you know, how much does one crank of the handle bring my jig up? You can see that the majority of the fish here are suspended up in a column and there's fewer fish down here. The more time we spend in the strike zone, the more fish we're going to catch. So before you start fishing that day, you just want to put the jig out here and turn the handle one crank. How far did that move? Will it move six feet or 10 feet? Well, now you know when you drop it all the way to the bottom, one crank pulls me up 10 feet. Well, then I can look at the sonar and go, okay, I need to reel up three cranks and then I'm going to be in the strike zone. And then where's the top of the strike zone? Well, that's five more cranks. So once I get eight cranks off the bottom, now I need to go back down again. And a, another thing too is if your sonar is dialed in, you can see your line and your jig in the water. If not, one thing I use a lot on my boat, and especially for people who've never done it before, I use a lot of metered line. I use that Power Pro Depth Hunter, and it changes colors every 25 feet. But there's also a tick mark, I think every five feet. So you can really say to people like, hey, drop it down until it turns green. And just kind of wiggle your rod around there and see if you can. And I'm kidding by wiggling, but use your action there. And I, I think sometimes, yeah, I mean, if, if your fish are all stacked up here and you're fishing in the middle of it, great. But I think sometimes if you're just above it, fish, if you look at them, most of them, except for like catfish, red drum, um, and some other fish, their eyes are on the top of their head and they're always looking up. Most of those fish feed up. So I think sometimes you can pick off some of the bigger ones if you're a little bit higher in the water column. And I don't disagree with that at all because a lot of times if if you if you're going let's say we put up on a spot we're just going to snapper fish with live cigar mouths. One of the worst things you can do is pull up on the spot and run the live cigar minnow all the way to the bottom. Because you run it all the way to the bottom and all the little ones are going to be down there because if they get up in the water column, they just become food for somebody else. Bigger snappers are all going to be up in the water column somewhere, generally speaking. Well, if you drop it all the way to the bottom and you hook one real quick because they're normally the smaller ones are very aggressive, when well, you drop it down, you immediately get a bite, you pull him up, then all his buddies swim up there and then they get all intertwined with the nicer snappers you want to catch. It's much better to work your way down to the fish. And even though if the bite comes a little bit slower, you'll catch a better quality fish. And change it up too. And so one thing we, and I, I'm gonna tell you everything that I can, I, and I, I'm not gonna hide anything. Like this is literally what I do to try to catch fish, but it's different. So, I mean, I think you guys have noticed this snapper fishing with bait and with heavier tackle. Like you get to a spot where it may have worked on Saturday and then you go on Sunday and it's totally different. And sometimes, the best guy on my boat uh, with a rod, I'm like, there's one story in particular, and I'm, I know, do you guys want us to get back on jigging, or do you want it? I mean, I'm happy to, okay. Um, there was one guy on the boat who caught seven of the eight snapper, and I was like, what are you doing different? And he was like, well, I dropped to the bottom, and I reel up 25 times. And I'm like, all right, we're in like 60 feet of water. I was like, can you show me that? And he dropped down, and he reeled up, and his bait was like five feet underneath the boat, and there was snapper everywhere, and he, and I was like, how did, how did we miss this? And it, I was like, so, all right, guys, adjustment. And everybody was like, so we drop down and reel up 25 times? I'm like, no, literally just put it in the water. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one of those things where, like, sometimes I've had my best bite with this thing literally just sitting on the bottom, not moving. And sometimes you think about maybe the boat's rocking and it's picking up and putting it down. I've had in free spool just sitting on the bottom because I'm helping somebody untangle something or unhook a fish over here and I'll kind of close it, start reeling. And I'm like, how did that happen? So then I look at the guy next to me. I'm like, hey, just let your jigs sit on the bottom. 
<laughs> like don't do anything. And then he's like, hey, I got a good one. Um, just one thing I will say, don't, yeah, my big point is I feel like it's different. So if somebody's telling you you have to do it this way or you must use this and you have to do it this way, like, no, you don't. A lot of the tackle you have, as long as you know what you're doing, yeah, there's a system, it's designed, it's easier, you, there's, a, there's more um, wiggle room for failure, I guess. Like if you do something wrong, it's more forgiving. Um, but it's different um, every day. But one thing I'll say not to do, this is the same boat I have. Don't leave this in a rod holder with your jig in the water because that boat will be rocking in the waves. And then all of a sudden, a king mackerel or wahoo is going to smack that jig and take everything with it. So we've had an awful lot of bites. And 99% of the time, if I've got people jigging or bait fishing, um, and there's kind of like two seconds of no action, yeah, I'm grabbing a rod and I'm going to try to fish off the side, see if I can hook something and hand the rod off. And then somebody will hook up, and I'm like, oh put mine in a rod holder, go over here, and then my rod's screaming off in the corner. I'm like, there's too many rods at the same time. So just be careful leaving a jig fluttering in the water when it's not in your hand. I am. I'm all over the place. So if you, were, if you go on and read about slow pitching or you go on and watch YouTube videos about slow pitching, there's going to be fairly different opinions on this. That Does pitch mean that we pitch the jig with the rod, or do we pitch the jig by motioning the handle of the reel? It's actually both. We can, we can use just the pitch of the rod, or we can leave the rod basically still, and by turning the handle, the rod will bend as it starts to pick the jig up, and then when you do that one little quick crank, then it goes flip, and then the rod tip flips the jig into the air, or you can use them in tandem with each other jig and well jig with the rod and jig with the reel or pitch the rod and pitch the reel it could be done all three ways work i like to think of pitch as and and this is weird so my first time that i ever did this i lived in japan for a while um i liked and i don't speak japanese i don't know what anybody was saying i just think i'm a pretty good fisherman and i caught some really good fish i like to think of pitch as like the whole cycle so and i not so much what the rod and reels doing because that feels like an extension of my body um but i think about what the jig's actually doing so i think about like okay if i can shoot the jig up this way and let it flutter that's a pitch to me and then if i can shoot it up and let it flutter but it's not i personally i don't really care for the name slow pitch jigging because it's confusing to people and people are like, well, do I go real slow? I'm like, hell no, sometimes I go fast on this. I mean, you're making, you're trying to make that bait look erratic and appetizing to something different. So and yeah, this is my, that's my favorite graphic, yeah. which really shows it. And it's a matter of making the jig do different things. You can see here, there's high speed lift, half or one-to-one, -one, half crank, different things. Very, vary what you're doing as you're coming up, especially the first few stops you make, to find out what the fish are feeding that day. And, and it's a huge change of pace, too. So, like, you've got a high-speed lift, but then these without falls in them. Yeah, I guess it says without falls. You can see it. It's like, it's like walking the dog with the top water lure, making that thing dart certain directions and do stuff. The difference over here, they're doing the same kind of thing, but between each pitch they're let, giving a little slack and letting that thing flutter. So it's kind of like a flop up, flutter, jump over here, flutter. It's just a different thing. So for me, it keeps me from getting bored. Like I, I don't like sitting still on my boat a whole lot. I, I don't like it. So if I, can, if I can really feel it or if I'm like, all right, well, this isn't working, this isn't working. The, the hardest part about this though is remembering what you were doing when that fish hit. Because somebody will get hit, and I'm like, what were you doing? They're like, man, I don't know. I just caught that grouper. I, well, I don't know what just happened. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. Well, I was catching it either. So it's, 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 so it's time to go back and review the GoPro. Yeah, what the that, heck were they and, doing? And luckily, there's GoPros on the boat, so you can just yell, GoPro, start recording, and then look at it and go, all right, you were doing nothing when that hit. 
Um, but it's, I think the most important part of this graphic to me is showing like this is more of like a, it, the same analogy of, of walking the dog with the top water, just changing direction, pitching back and forth, kind of erratic, giving it a little bit slower action. So like the, my dog analogy, you're not, that fish isn't bored looking at it. Um, Cause I think just like bass fishing in the, in the spawn and stuff, it's a react, it's, it can be a reaction bite. It's just like it's bass fishing at Sandestin in July and August. And I think that's why this was designed and how this came up. Like how can you catch fish when they're not necessarily feeding? Like, can you piss, this, can I say that? Yeah. Can you piss this fish off enough to get a bite? Um, so sometimes it's like a mix of all of this and some days they're gonna bite. And I think the red marks here typically show where you get bit. And like this one is on the flutter on the way down, it got bit. And this one is right at the transition to the next movement. Um, so it's, we, we joke a lot and we say like, you can't really do this wrong. Yeah, there's like a technique and a style and a thing you're supposed to do. But realistically, I mean, if, if you follow that order of operations that I, I brought up earlier, you'll probably hook something, but if you are cognizant of what the jig's doing, what you're doing, you can probably remember what was happening at the moment of strike to try to duplicate that and make it happen again throughout the rest of the summer. And then, you know, you have to rig the jig. Most of the jigs come to some degree rigged, but it is very important on how the jig is rigged some jigs come with no hooks, no, no terminal gear on them. They just sell just a jig. Most come with either a single hook or some variety of two, three, or four hooks. But it's very, very easy to lose fish that you did hook because you don't have it rigged properly. It's real important that, it, that on the, and we have a different, little different opinion on this and it's both work really well. But the one thing that we have in common is on the end of the lure that we're going to tie to, and this is the top up here, but you can actually see it a little bit better on the bottom. You don't tie, there's a split ring and then there's a solid ring that the hooks are attached to. Your line needs to be attached in such a way that the pressure comes directly from the hook through your leader into the rod. So if you've tied onto the eyelet or the lure, or the split ring, that is wrong. You must tie to the solid ring. That, that way the lure is free and there's direct contact from the fish to the hook, to the leader, to the rod, and everything that you're gonna fight. Um, I like, to me, it's just, I like it better with, the more hooks, the better. I can't, I'm, I'm fine with having too many um, rather than not enough. But Mark doesn't like it that way. I, there, we, uh, and maybe we're just super lucky or maybe I'm a fishing nerd and think about it too much, but we catch a lot of fish. IGFA released a whole bunch of slow pitch records that are, I think, very obtainable on a lot of them. IGFA rules won't allow four hooks on a jig. Uh, I think when slow pitch jigging came out and was invented, they were using four hooks and I think that's why some people adopted that and started going through it. Yes, um, luck, I was just looking at the back of these because a lot of these on the back will tell you what the action looks like and obviously like how it's weighted and why the hooks are in a certain way. Most of them will tell you what they're made to do on the back. Um, I sometimes will run this exactly how it is out of the package. A lot of times. Um, that's how the engineers at Shimano designed that. And this, at Jig Pro, they wanted it to be like that. I don't like having four hooks on mine because am I going to cut my line off and send it into IGFA and go through that whole process? I mean, realistically, if you're fishing three hooks and not four, is it that big of a difference? Maybe, but I mean, if you also end up with a world record out of it, isn't that pretty cool too? Yeah. Um, and I think too, hooks will walk. So I've, uh, the, uh, again, I think what most people are comfortable with are king mackerel. You've seen king mackerel hit a trolling plug where they get that back hook in their mouth. Then they're flopping around and that front hook will flip around and get them inside. And that front hook will come out. So a lot of times too, like you'll see not only, yeah, they may hit it on the fall and attack the head side of the lure, 
But when you get that fish up to the boat, be aware of like, okay, which hook did I actually get it set in that? Was it the back one? Was it the front one? And then kind of adjust maybe where you put your hooks or how you're fishing based on how he was hooked. Because if you hook him, if you get that fish up to the side and he snagged at his dorsal fin, he probably had a hook in his mouth at some point. Look at his mouth and see if there's a hole in it um, and see if maybe that hook walked around. And, and the main reason that I like hooks on both ends is when you're jigging the jig, the, a fish is generally going to attack the head of a bait fish, whether it's a live bait fish or a jig. Well, depending on where you are in the pitch motion, this is the head, and now this is the head on the next. The head changes orientation as the jig does this. So I like to have hooks on both ends. That's why I always have a hook on the end of the lure that the fish is most likely to strike. Now, the one thing that you do want to do is if you're going to use hooks on both ends, you need to make sure that the hooks are not so long that they can touch each other. If the two hooks can touch each other, the, the jig will tangle more times than it will not. And, so, and also too, like if you're doing something a little weird, just be cognizant of where your hooks are if you're hooking your own leader a lot. I think it can have a lot to do with the technique of maybe what you're doing, how much slack you have in your line, the tension you're under, the kind of action you're giving it if your jig's actually flipping around and tangling up in your own leader. So but the, main, the main thing you need to realize here is that you must attach to the solid ring. That way, when you're, once you do hook a fish, you're fighting directly in line and you're keeping the pressure on the fish. I do run mine slightly different. Uh, well, I'll let you keep going. But you still have it. Yeah. It's still in line with... Correct. As long as it's hooked on this top one. If I'm hooked on the other side of the jig then it's different so so in other words if my jig is here and i hook it on this back one i'd have i have that lever arm in the middle hinged yeah so so i'm huge on terminal tackle and some of the guys some old school guys and everybody will say oh don't use that much stuff don't use speed clips i'm like yeah right i'm gonna catch i'm gonna outfish you and i'm gonna use all the clips that i can uh, because I like to swap things out. I like to change things. Um, what I like most importantly, and I think this is probably somewhere in your next sl couple slides, if not this one, I like to drive my boat real fast. I mean, you can tell by l looking at it, like these things want to go. I don't like, tr I, I don't like trolling. You, you already know that. Um, I like to get from spot to spot quick. I, I like to drive like this. I like to have it easy enough that I can take my jig out. If I leave my jig in a cup holder from spot to spot, that's fine, yeah. But I like to go and I don't want lead swinging around. The same way I bottom fish with my snap-on, or we do with our snap-on leads, um, I'll run my leader to a swivel. Well, this is a ball bearing swivel to a split ring to my assist hook. This way I can use a pair of split ring pliers and throw on whatever jig I want. So yeah, I have, I've got tackle on my boat loaded up with jigs with extra hooks on it or whatever. But if I get to the spot where I want to fish, I grab those pliers, I put whatever jig on I want, see what it's doing in the water. If there's too much current, if it's not enough weight, I can clip, use those split ring pliers and put on a different jig and drop it right back down. So I like to do this mainly for ease of changing my jig. Uh, and so I can drive fast as hell from spot to spot. Um, so we covered those. That's the split ring pliers we were just talking about. Um, and good split rings yeah. too. Bad split rings will open. Buy the owner's split rings. Don't buy the little, um, I think we have one at the store. I think they're made by like a company called Hildebrandt. For $1.99, you get like two dozen. And these you get eight for $4.99. They're quite a bit more money, but you don't. these do not bend out. Same thing with your solid rings. Buy a quality solid ring. Um, you know, they make all kind of different. Uh, there's Owner. There's um, Jig Pro makes hook sets. We carry hook sets by BKK. Several different brands. 
um, just buy a quality brand of, and they come in like three out, five out, seven out, and then they come short, medium, long. That way you can space the hooks out on your rigs really easy. Um, most of the time for bottom fishing, we suggest just using regular monofilament for leaders. Um, but with the slow pitch jigging, there is some definite advantages to fishing with fluorocarbon for that because we're going to fish much higher up in the water column sometimes. Yeah, and, and most of our jigging here in Destin is much shallower water relative to a lot of how some of this stuff was designed. Like you can jig this stuff in thousands of feet of water. Like that's, that's great. And I honestly, I don't think fluoro matters if you're at a thousand feet deep. Uh, I mean, maybe I guess for a little bit of abrasion resistance, but I don't think, I mean, it's a reaction bite. I don't, I don't think that that matters tremendously. Now I, I say that, but everything I have is rigged exactly with 60 pound fluoro. Um, I like fishing a little bit heavier, um, but I do think in our, the way I slow pitch in Destin, I don't think it, I mean, I, I'm still going to put fluoro on because I don't want to go spend all the money, spend all the fuel, get out there and then not get a bite and go, damn, I should have used, used fluoro, you know? You know, and something we didn't cover too is, um, you know, we do have, we do need to have braid for this. Um, generally, I think both of us either fish with 40, 50, or 65 braid. Uh, most of the purest slow pitch guys will say 20 or 30. Well, I don't think they're catching the size of the fish that we catch. They're not catching fishing on wrecks that are as heavy as we fish. And our fishery requires a little bit heavier gear. Um, and, and we're only fishing, I mean, at max, for me, on a small boat, max 350 feet. So like you're, a lot of you're not getting the the drag in the water from a and from a slightly heavier braid you're not getting most of that yeah and like the rig that mark has there it's got the shimano oc at 2000 2000 the, the or Osha jigger too yeah and then this is my little trinidad 12a uh both you know this is spool with like i think i have 40 pound on this one i have 60 pound fluoro leader on here um you do, if you have it, if you don't know how to tie an FG knot, um, to me, an FG is essential for this. It goes through the guides, it works really well. Um, an FG is very, for most people, an FG is fairly difficult to tie. But if you will learn the reverse FG, it is very easy to tie. You don't have to have tension on the spool with your foot and wrapped around this button and around my little finger and this ear and have my buddy hold it and we do all this twisting. Uh, Mark did a great video on YouTube. If you just type in 30A uh, reverse FG, um, a great little tutorial on how to do it. Or I, can you show you, I can show you one after this if yeah. anyone wants to see it. You it's should be really able to easy. tie a reverse FG and I mean, under a minute for sure, but you really should be able to do it in under 30 seconds. It's not a complicated knot. If you're tying the, the original FG, they make these PR bobbin tool, PK PR bobbin tools, whatever they're called. That's just and throw I, that in the garbage. I mean, we fought a, like a 500 pound bull shark for an hour and a half on one of these things on that reverse FG that we tied not under tension in a minute on the boat while it was moving from spot to spot and if it will hold for that i'm not really worried about it yeah. so yeah i mean people test like breaking strength of knots and, and go through all this stuff and yeah there might be one that is stronger but this damn thing this damn thing works fine for me i don't think there's one that's stronger than if an fg tied right i don't think there's anything stronger yeah i mean it and I plus it'll go right through the guides because you can tell the guides on these are small um Plus, I, I like it for me on my charter because I know when I hear someone's leader, their wind on start coming through the guides, you hear that like, ding, 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 ding. I'm like, slow down. Like, you've got this fish now. Like, don't reel this thing into the rod tip. Just just slow down. How long is the leader? I generally, like, mine's probably, I start off about 25 foot a leader, and I, then I replace it when it gets down to less than six or eight feet. So. I think leader often, especially for regular bottom fishing with heavier tackle, people go into shock. Um, I don't think, especially for me in Destin, one, you're probably fishing Destin. Um, Destin water, it's not, I mean, if you're in a 
200 feet of water with a 10 foot leader, I mean, your shock on that might be max, like what, a foot? I don't know, I've, I haven't done that study, but like you're not using that for shock. This rod is gonna be your, your shock. Um, so like a lot of times guys are like, oh, you need a super long leader. But I'm like, if that fish wants to wiggle, I mean, look at how much, I mean, that's a foot right there just in the, in the rod. Um, and I guess there's, there, I mean, there's styles and there's techniques of how to find fish, but I, sometimes I'll get away with using a really, really short leader. And for me, I mean, I have to buy my own leader. So I'm like, I'm gonna use, I don't know, maybe two arm lengths and see how that goes. And or maybe Tim's getting a little bit better bite than me because he gets his leader for free and he's using 65 Since feet of fluoro. Since when do I leader for free? Uh, <laughs> you, know, just, you, know, you, know what I, you know what I mean, but so, yeah, he's taking, it out, he's taking it off of my boat. You're exactly right. So That's when, why I get sabiki rigs. When Tim ties a leader on my boat, he's like this. He's like, all right, all right, let's just keep going. Um, but no, for me, for me, I mean, I'll, I'll probably do if I'm what I what I like to do personally is I'll do like just a couple, bunch of arm lengths, um, just enough to get a good wrap on on here because when it starts getting chafed up from from gill breakers or gill plates or at the bottom if people are, are all the way to the bottom when it does start getting chewed up instead of tying on a new FG and a longer leader, I like just being able to cut off like the bottom foot of it or whatever is and especially like if you are fishing deep and you get one of those fish and he's floating on the way and he's got barrow trauma which is a whole nother conversation to have and he's spinning on the way up and he comes up with his eyes popping out and his stomach out of his mouth you're definitely going to have a chafe leader so i mean if you check that and if your leader's a little bit longer, you can snip that and and retie on uh your your swivel or your solid ring or whatever you're going to do uh, but you, you can see on mine there's not there's not much but it might, might be 15 feet what about spiral guides versus your standard i th i think i mean it's cool i i, I think we have some here uh, it'll definitely help the twist depending on the construction of the rod um, some rods are kind of designed to prevent that um, but that acid wrap was for that i think if you're holding this reel in your hand and some of these reels are designed with a spot for your index finger and your thumb if you're holding it right and you kind of have it kind of pinned under your elbow the right way when you're working it and then you get it in the right spot and you're fishing it right i think it's pretty hard for a little rod to want to roll um but acid wrap rods aren't so you look like you're about to say something what they're really designed for is Every rod has a natural bend. So if you put your rod on the, if you come in the store, you get your own rod and you twirl it, that's the natural bend of the rod. It wants, that's where this rod wants to bend. So it's not lined up with the real seat. When we build a custom rod, the first thing we do is we check the blank, see where it bends, and we mark it. If it's a spinning rod, the guides would go in here. If it's a conventional rod, the guides would go on the outside. That way, when you hook a big fish on a, like a big conventional solid glass rod, if it's not splined correctly, the rod wants to twist this way or this way in your hand. This system of acid wrap where the guides wrapped underneath the rod, they take most of that error from the rod not being built on spline out of the equation. That's really, that's its main purpose. Um, but like Mark said, on a rod this size, while it is a cool concept, I don't know that it adds that much advantage. Like if you're um, on like a 30 wide on a broomstick rod and you're like, have it on your hip and it, you're like, well, this is weird. But on these, like it's, it's a lot it's a lot different fight. Plus, I think in general, your fight is a lot more, I, I say intimate, um, more fun. It is. Um, questions? Have you, have you used this slow pitch rod before? Yes. Can you, yeah. can you just kind of demonstrate 
trying to put that together in my brain. Trying to do so when you say fast pitch, do you mean you just vertical speed jig? So that and that's what that's I think a huge uh, thing in it is the word pitch. So people are like, what makes it? Because you can slow pitch jig fast. Um, so it and realistically, it kind of changes all the time. Um, sometimes it's uh, just a crank because the rods are designed really to, and, and I've played hockey in a different life, and I use the analogy, which probably helps nobody other than me explain this. Um, and we were talking about this earlier today. You take a slap shot and people are like, oh, you just have to swing real hard and hit the puck. And I'm like, well, you could also use like a real flexible stick and hit behind the puck, flex the stick, and let it snap through because a stick wants to be straight and a fishing rod wants to be straight. So when you can get that thing loaded right, whether it's just, I mean, if you drop your jig over the side of your boat and you just crank hard once, you'll see the rod so load. Hold your tip for a second. So if you cranked really hard, what would happen is just pull up a little bit. This is what ha that would happen if he cranked really hard. And then if you let go fast, it'll shoot that jig up. So, so I, sometimes that's it, your, put tension on it again. When when you've cranked and bent the rod and I let go, that, that was a pitch. That jig goes boom. And then if you do it again real fast, you might make it shoot again this way. So you can, I, I think more, it depends on the jig and your combo on what you're making your, or your what you're making the jig do. So like over the side of the boat, if you if you kind of like lift up on the rod real slow, you may see, you might see it go up. If you kind of lift up faster, you might see it jump. If you crank a full turn, see what your jig actually does in the water. If you crank a half turn, see what it does and then start playing around with it. And luckily our water here is so clear you can see this to kind of play with it to learn what your jig is, is doing. Does that make any sense? So how does it look like in real time? I guess not how am I going to do this? I'm going to get that hook in my hand, aren't I? No, I'm just going to put it on the ground. So, you know, slow pitch <laughs> is... And then fast pitch, I can do either, and I can do it by just the rail, I can do it by just the handle, or I can do it as a combination of both. And you've got times too where you like might want to shoot that jig up and just let it flutter down the, the entire time. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the change of pace. So yeah, you can do the same movement over and over and over, but that fish is looking at it like, I don't know what that thing is doing, but if, by changing it up and figuring out what's working that day, it, it really helps. What was probably the most confusing answer I've given? No, so, uh, like the combination, using combination sometimes to find where the fish are in the water column. Yeah, so what I would do first of all is if, if you know what you're looking at on your sonar, it, it, it helps a lot. So for us, like I'm, I'm just thinking about like if, if the three of us are on my boat and I'm looking at my chart and I'm like, damn, there's a really good show at like 160 feet. So I might say, all right, get that jig down somewhere around there, maybe a little bit lower and get it in where they can see it and, and see what you can do. And if you get up out too far up and nothing's happening, let that thing flutter back down and then maybe jerk it hard and see if you can really piss that fish off and, and see what happens adjusting from there. But I, I think that all stems from knowing what you're looking at on the chart. Uh, otherwise, you're just kind of like, it's like, the top water analogy, if you're on a boat on a tower and there might be a fish over here, but you're casting way over there, he might not even see it. And if all the oil shows, just put a live cigar on the bottom of the jig. <laughs> don't take bait out. So if you seriously want to do this, don't even take live bait because that same thing will happen to me. And I, I'm running a charter and people are looking at me because they expect fish. Um, and they're like, well, I want my eight year old daughter to catch a uh, limit a fish on a slow pitch rod. I'm like, that's a really weird situation to put me in, but we're going to do the best that we can and I'll get to a spot. And I, we never really got into this yet, but there is that order of operations where you get to a spot. And if I try this a couple times and it doesn't work, it's very, very easy for, I think most of the people in this room to go, all right, screw this. Let's grab a bait and send it down. 
Um, I do think that uh, on, often, too, on my boat, somebody's on live bait, somebody's on cut bait, and somebody's like, hey, can I jig? And I'm like, sure, but this is going to get really weird. I mean, if I was a fish down on the bottom and there's a live cigar minnow, a frozen cigar minnow, and some weird metal thing jumping around over here, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes they will hit the jig. As a matter of fact, my last trip that I took out, dead bait, frozen bait, live bait, cut bait, bonita squid, frozen cigar minnows, zero bites. Dropped a jig once and hooked a scamp. Um, which I was like, and I looked at them and I was like, I told you that was going to work. But I do think the normally the jig will work better if you try it before you start doing other things. So sometimes I'll suggest jig first. If you're not, if it's not working after, for me, I mean, I, and I say this a lot for seminars, I'm like, give it some time. But realistically for me on a charter with paying customers, expecting to catch fish, I don't give it as long as I should before I start switching to other baits. But I do think if you start live bait and then try to jig, Sometimes it works, but the overall percentage, your probability of catching a fish is better going jig, frozen bait, live bait, uh, as opposed to the opposite. But if you've dropped a short, fat, stubby jig and you haven't gotten a bite, well, let's go to a different shape of jig. One's a little lighter, a little heavier. Let's try a pencil jig. Let's try changing colors because it's still, there's an old fly fish term called match the hatch. And sometimes we have to experiment a little bit before we catch our first one. Once you catch your first one, then you'll catch a whole bunch more. But what are they, just because they bit silver and white yesterday, they might bite pink and black today. And they might bite a jig that's about this big. Yes. I repeat the question for um. yeah so the question was does the depth of water change the color of jig i like i want my jig to have either glow or um the uh can't think of the word it's not luminescent uv uv I want my jig to have either uv or glow on it. as long as it has one of the two or a combination of both and you can have glow and uv in any color so long as it has one, it has one of the two. I've caught more fish on glow, something with glow in it, than without. But again, I also use it a lot more often. So me personally, like if you were on my boat, I'd give you one with with some kind of light, not refraction, yeah. but some kind of glow. When we first when we first started slow pitching, or when I first started, you know, I went with the normal stuff that okay this is what works for all kind of bottom fish and so i went with stuff that looked like cigar minnows and herring those baits didn't work as good as some of the other colors especially anything that has glow in it unless unless you're fishing really shallow and then i like things that are really shiny so i think sometimes like like some of these that have a mix of glow and some something that'll reflect the sunlight helps a ton for me because I mean, I think I don't know, and I should probably know this as the as a self-proclaimed nerd, I guess. Uh, I I don't know how far sunlight can penetrate in the water, but 90% of my fishing is less than 100 feet of water. So I'm using smaller jigs. It's a little bit more. I think it's a little bit harder. I think a lot of jigging once you get in deeper water. I don't necessarily think there's the same amount of bait, and especially here, I don't think it's the same amount of pressure. So sometimes I think if you locate those fish and you know what you're looking at on your sonar and you get a jig in the strike zone, you know how that jig's reacting. And I mean, not just like, like if you've got any tension on the line and that jig is just straight falling through and not fluttering or have any action. If you have any situational awareness of what your jig is doing, you're in a strike zone, you're on a spot with fish and you're in deeper water. I think for me, when guys call and they're like, hey, I only want a jig. I'm like, we might need to go out a little bit deeper for a more consistent, like traditional slow pitch that you'd see on a TV show or something like that, as opposed to some of the state water stuff where it's a smaller jig, a little bit shinier and a little less how it was invented when it came out. What else we got? Tim. 
you always use a swivel on your rig, on your jig, or do you just go straight solid ring sometimes? I like a swivel. I, if I'm using a big jig, I will, if it's fluttering a lot, it's getting a lot of action, I will use a ball bearing swivel or something like that. Um, I often use a very small jig in state water, which I also use to cast to breaking fish. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. I use it for every species of fish. I use the same combo, vertical jigging, slow pitch jigging, casting at breaking schools of redfish, Spanish kings, everything. And I, I like to run a, like a tactical angler speed clip on it because A, I think it, for a king especially, it gives, I mean, if that, the king is chasing the bait. So if he gets that hook in him, he's gonna be, I mean, he's gotta either be a huge king or I'm reeling too slow if he can get inhale that whole thing. So typically when he bites, you can get away with a single hook, a jig, and that little clip, which gives enough wiggle room so that king's teeth can't get all the, I mean, that's a huge chafe guard to get away from. So you can get away with like 30 pound leader. Um, but I'll use that same thing because that split ring, or I'm sorry, that ball bearing swivel or that tactical angler's clip also kind of acts like a loop knot. So like when you bass fish and you have a loop knot, you can get a lot more action on it. So it gives a, enough distance from your leader to get a little extra action on it uh, with a little extra terminal hardware. So I say that, that's what I'd like to do. Like if I was rigging everything up at home the night before, I'd probably use a little bit more hardware, but on the boat, when somebody's hooked up and there's a school of fish jumping on the surface over there, I'm gonna cut that damn thing. I'm gonna tie it on whatever jig I have straight to the leader and launch it back out as fast as I can. Uh, the ones I prefer, this tactical anglers clip, come in 50, 75, and 100. I think they, uh, they might come bigger than that. I prefer the 75s. I probably have one in my backpack. I'll show you. Um, or you can have it, and that's the size that. I prefer the 50. The 25? Um, I prefer 50, I think, is too small because I catch a lot of like decent sized king mackerel on, on spinning, like really light spinning gear. Um, so I like to have a little more backbone, but even then, like on a lot of these things, these have a lot more power. They're, they're designed with a lot more drag. Um, the drag capability is often bigger than the braid. I fish a little weirder where I'll use braid slightly heavier than the drag. The reel that I like to use is about 24 pounds of drag. So if I'm using 30 pound braid, I'll crank, I will lock down that drag. And some people in here should cover their ears because I will lock down that drag, which is not designed to do that, but it's fun. And you can give it to an inexperienced angler and say, okay, as long as you hold on to the rod, the worst thing that's gonna happen is line's gonna come off the reel. Like the line's not gonna break, or I'm sorry, the line will break before the reel does or anything happens. So you can get locked down the drag and, and get past some of those big runs or some of that stuff fighting a heavy drag on a heavier, I'm sorry, a lighter drag on a heavier line. Um, which is really weird. If, if, like hearing myself say it, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. But then Tim gives me a lot of stuff because like I'll fight lockdown drag on with 30 pound drag, but on a 24 pound max reel. Um, and Tim's like, it's too much drag. I'm like, he's taking off line. Like, it's not like, I'm as, I'm not that bad, but if you're on 50 pound drag and on a conventional reel, you, you know what I mean? Like that line will, that line will snap. That was a really confusing answer too. I'm all over the place tonight. I'm sorry, guys. Hopefully you guys what learned else? something though. What else we got? Yes, yeah. sir. So typically when we were traditional bottom fishing for snappers and groupers and different jacks and things, we do do a lot of two speed stuff, but the slow pitch thing, thing we are fishing much lighter gear and most of the rods, it, it's just not a, that effective. 
and they don't make the two most of the two speeds don't come quite small enough and it, it's they do they have started making like a they lever. get all the way down to an eight now don't they yeah they do make a talica eight now which would be small enough um the talica 12 is a little heavy but you could a talica eight two speed would work and and a lot of this is like if you look at how narrow the spool is it fits in your hand pretty good it's easy because i mean you're you do use it a little bit more like there's a lot more movement and some of those bigger two-speed reels are a much wider spool and sometimes you'll run into some line lay issues where you're trying to use your thumb and get things to lay right but on these like you can see my thumb pretty much takes up that whole spool so it's it's pretty much a slow pitch it's a, a real design for slow pitch um, although I will say sometimes when you hook in the, and plus, I mean, the gear, the gearing in this, you can tell by looking at it, these things are, are kind of designed to crank. Yeah, but you're if you're in high gear with a big fish on, you're not going to move him nearly as fast as you are in low gear with more power. Yes, sir. They definitely work. I mean, you put it on a lot. You can put it on a light little bent butt rod, stick it in the rod holder, and hit the jigging function, and go sit in a chair. Yeah. Do <laughs> well, you tell you tell us? I've never tried it. You love it? So far, so good. Good. Yeah, and a lot of it too. And we didn't really get into a lot of the how to fight fish on these. Like, there's definitely a thing. And a, and a lot of guys on my boat who are used to conventional fishing, the first. And I remember I had a brand new rod, a brand new combo that was like my personal favorite that i was like this is mine and the very first fish we hooked on it you and i were hired to run a trip and the very first fish i was like oh my brand new rod and i was like oh this is a good one and i looked over at the guy running who owned the boat and he was like give it to my son and i was like ah. i was like okay fine and i handed it to him and the first thing he did was it was kind of like under my elbow and then I, I, I think I think on the bite, I think I ended up here. And I was like, oh, no, this is a good one. And he was like, give it to my son. And I was like, okay. And I handed it over to him, my brand new rod. And he takes it and he goes. And I was like, oh, no, please don't do that. And we got that fish to the boat. But it's they're not designed to do that. So the fight is slightly different. And I know we're kind of going long. And I don't yeah. want to bore everybody to death. Um, the fight is different. And I guess the Cliff Notes version if that rod tip gets up over your hat, you're you're in trouble. So my whole fight is pretty much from my, I say my hat, but some guys will say like parallel to the water or horizontal, but I'll say if that rod comes up over your hat, I'm gonna say something, but it, it's not just necessarily up and down, but a lot of times on a big fish, I'll go out with it too. And I'll, I'll, I'll point that thing at the fish and I'll gain a whole bunch back and I'll pull that damn thing towards me as opposed to getting up and down. But again, I'm fishing a he little bit heavier line, a little bit lighter drag on spinning gear, my hands on the spool and I'm pulling that thing. This like it's, it, you're not supposed to do that, but it, it works. I'm all over the place tonight, Tim. That's all right. Well, I think Mark's got a couple goodies up here to give away. And I'm going to come through and pass out some discount cards for everybody. Um, this is a little, it's a $20 off a $50 purchase. If y'all haven't been to the seminars before, um, get these for y'all. I don't think we have a little twirly thing. You may have to just yeah. toss um, stuff. And uh, I'm, I, I think the better angler you become, the less you care about just killing, going out to kill fish. I mean, yeah, catching uh Killing fish and getting a good dinner is a big part is a big part of it for sure. But I think you get everybody kind of gets to a certain area where you start killing fish and you not necessarily feel bad, but you're like, do I need 
15 king mackerel today when I'm going back out tomorrow? Probably not. Um, so, I mean, you guys know about Return Them Right and the Barrow Trauma Release Program. Uh, I do have cards from Return Them Right uh, with a QR code on the back that if you scan the code and watch the little video, they will send you a free, which is legally required to have on a boat, either a vent tool or a descending device. They will send you a free kit with the weight and the sequelizer release device. Uh, so I do have some of these on here. Um, normally we've got a, a raffle thing for giveaways, but we've got a we've got a bunch of hats and stuff up here. And I did bring two products that I use on my boat. This is a graphene protectorant. Um, I've given out some of these in the past. This is what I. It's the only thing that I've found so far without like a professional ceramic coating to actually clean my boat. Um, you basically just spray this on. Uh, and I mean, literally, I'll just go around my boat and spray and just barely wipe it on. But it's the only thing that I've found so far um, to keep that tannic line off of my boat, that brown line that most of us get on the bay. So I do have a graphene spray and some boat soap and a bunch of hats. Um, do them like they do at football games, just throw. Just throw them? Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> just throw them overhand at you guys. Um, we got to come up with something, right? Yeah. Um, it's your birthday? Oh, well, you get one anyway for saying it. Oh, oh so, sorry. Sorry, I hit you. Um, all right, hold on. Let's do pop quizzes and whoever says it first. Um, what's more fun, uh, conventional or spinning gear? All right. Uh, you said I think you I think you guys tied. Um, uh, what's that? Lighter's better. Weird. You win. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? Uh, what was your What was the yes. best? What was something that you guys learned tonight? Get to fish, and then I was worried about it. Oh, you you damn go. right I do. <laughs> Jay, what's that? Uh, you were you're close enough. All right, so silver one. All right, so and then Tim, Tim, come up with two good questions, and whoever gets it, this is, this is a grand prize right here. Oh, what what's the most important part of jigging? Damn, that's good. That's good, but that's not the answer. That's a really good one. Soap or graphene? Thanks, man. That doesn't have wax in it, so it won't just, awesome. yeah, I, I prefer that. And then this has a little nozzle on it. Where will the Dustin High School fishing reefs be deployed, state or federal? Oh. Well, I only have one, you guys. <laughs> Damn. You had to come up with a better question because everybody knew that. Uh, who's going to volunteer to be at this school event? You are. Um, you need a harder question, buddy. Who's got an Everglades? You. You got a neighbor who has one. Are you gonna go wax his boat for him? <laughs> How about you just roll it down the center? And no, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Scramble. Come on. Um, The first roll it down. Um, do you guys have any other questions for us? Can I get that? The wax? You don't even have the boat. You don't even like the boat. You just asked for it. We want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Next month's seminar is... Blood, red snapper, black snapper? Yeah, I think so. But first Tuesday of every month. Yeah, there's a go. Thank y'all for coming. Yep, the first Tuesday, first Tuesday of every month.